thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to talk about transportation, something that I realized this morning that we really haven't addressed in our lecture series uh, here at Brookings Mountain West, but we do try to be timely, and I wish I could take credit for some of the stuff that's been going on the last couple of days, but you may have seen uh, Governor Sandoval the other day re was talking about I-11, the interstate connection to Phoenix, and uh, sent a shout out to any presidential candidate that you better before that, if, before that if you want to carry Nevada. The uh, administration just today announced that it's going to seek 302 billion. I don't know where the two came from. Some, <laughs> somebody's got an earmark that they don't want to talk about. But uh, for transportation work, he's the, that's very vague, of course. And where the money's going to come from is allegedly from some corporate tax loopholes. But that would require Congress doing something, at least. And, we won't hold our breath on that. Uh, and of course, it was in the newspaper today that uh, Nevada has sold bonds for the Project Neon project. So transportation news happening all the time. And at Brookings Mountain West, we've been very interested in it, not just for I-11, which we think is a critical piece of infrastructure that our city and region needs and our state uh, to continue growth out of the recession. Uh, you may have heard community leaders in the business and political sector talking about bringing light rail to our city to help move both our 40 million visitors around as well as our workforce. Uh, so there's quite a bit to talk about. And my colleague Adi Tomer from Brookings is going to give us some background on the national picture, delve a little bit into Las Vegas as well. I'm going to get out of his way because he's got some inordinate number of slides <laughs> to, to get through. Not really. And uh, I will remember to say that uh, don't hurt yourself taking notes or things, because we'll, we'll have this PowerPoint up on our Brookings Mountain website tomorrow. Uh, so feel free to concentrate on the content. Can I turn it over to you, Adi? Thanks. All right, can everyone hear me? I'm on the, yeah, yeah. Any nods? Nothing? Any, anyone awake? Bueller, right? Um, um, well, first off, thanks to Brookings Mountain West for, um, for having me come out here. This is really just um, one kind of element of if for you know, those of you who haven't come to these talks before, um, they bring out a scholar, um, really just an employee right, from Brookings, uh, to uh, spend time in, in, the, in this portion of the Mountain West to get a better understanding for, for this area. And it's really been an awesome week so far um, to get an understanding for kind of how this whole place works, which frankly, I've never seen another metropolitan area or state that functions in this exact way. So it's really been a kind of fascinating um, experience. And you know, I'm a huge Las Vegas fan because I'm a younger man. My bachelor party was spent here. I've gone on other ones. You know, I like Las Vegas. I think Bill said I'm even the first Brookings employee to come who likes to gamble. So that's a really good thing. Um, I like to give Las Vegas your, my money, right? That's one of the catchphrases here. Um, but it's also really good to kind of talk about what I do to earn all that money that I can waste in Las Vegas. So um, today I'm going to talk about transportation broadly. Um, and it's also always good to be at a university to talk about this stuff so you can really kind of tap into that wonky, dorky side that normally when we're on the road we don't talk about. So um, I'm going to, obviously, it's going to move in five parts. Um, and I know that sounds really long. I have a clock. I will try to keep this as short as possible, although I guess we have kind of 30, 40 minutes or so. Um, so, and, and I want to emphasize too, if, if anything, if you can't see something or on the screen, I know we'll do questions at the end, but, but just shout, you know, tell me to point at something because uh, this was obviously done on a laptop and I'm not really sure how to look on here. So um, we're going to start with, you know, what's going on in the American economy? Um, you know, there's no better way to understand transportation than to understand what kind of environment it's working in. Um, and then from there, we're going to kind of talk a little bit, really briefly, really the academic portion of the program on what is even the purpose of transportation? Why does it exist? Why do we all use it? Um, from there, kind of the, really the biggest section is going to be about how does America move? Um, what's going on in our transportation network? How has that changed over time? And in particular, how does it look in Las Vegas in comparison both um, to itself, if you will, but also to other markets across the country? 
And then fourth, kind of where are the kind of failures in policy, right? We talk a lot in, um, you know, especially we read the news about market failures, right? But there's also such thing as policy failures. Um, that's really important in transportation since it's such a primarily publicly sector driven industry. And then finally, how can we kind of sync it all together? How can we make sure that policy and markets uh, um, uh, work for our mutual benefit moving forward? So back to where we began, um, you know, what's going on in the American economy today? Um, and some of this, you know, you'll probably be kind of familiar with. Um, we continue to have an intense jobs deficit um, here in the United States. And it's really kind of a frightening um, feature of really almost everyone's daily life. You know, typically, if you haven't lost a job, you know someone around you has. On um, the line we used to give, especially in the depths of the recession, is you look to your left or you look to your right, someone has been personally affected um, by the recession. And it's really kind of a scary element. Um, so we need to make sure that we have, we have more jobs in America. But we can't just have more. We need to have better jobs, too. They need to be better paying. You can see a huge increase um, in the number of households and of individuals in America that are poor or near poor just in, in a 10-year period, right? Um, it's really pretty frightening. And then finally, we also need to, though, make sure that people can get to the jobs that are available in their markets. And sometimes we kind of lose sight of that. Um, just because a job's available doesn't mean that's within reach. Um, and part of the problem for that is that in the United States, we've seen more and more folks moving out further to the fringe, um, those in particular that are low income. And that puts them in all kinds of tough situations relative to maybe not as much of a safety net, not as many, let's say, food bank programs and things on the suburban fringe. Um, but more than that, it just causes longer distances. And you can see between just over those years, um, a huge increase in the number of suburban poor um, uh, or the share of the poor that are living in the suburbs in the United States. What's also happening in the United States, though, and this is something that's especially fascinating to me, is that we don't do the same kind of work that we used to. Um, you can see this chart goes back all the way to 1970. Um, and even then, manufacturing uh, and jobs in those goods-related industries was only over a quarter of our, um, of our occupations. But as you move forward all the way to basically today, um, we're down to about 15% of jobs are actually in manufacturing or something directly related to it. Um, that's a huge change. Um, in a market like Las Vegas, in many ways, doesn't, of course, it existed in 1970, although it wasn't even old at, that old at that point. Um, but really, more than that, it's that this has become a symbol for the rest of the United States, is that people increasingly living in service industries, right? Creating value add on products made somewhere else by other people. Um, and that's just really the new reality of our marketplace. At the same time, we're also seeing massive changes in how the federal government operates. So um, my, my Boss's boss, Bruce Katz, who's in the news quite a bit often for a book he put out recently, has a great line about we're basically um, a standing army with an insurance company attached to it, right? So increasingly, um, we basically just pay interest on our own old spending. We have huge, huge chunks of mandatory spending. This is Medicare, Social Security um, uh, primarily. And then the actual programs that we tend to think the most about, right, when it comes to government, the actual stuff you can see often is really just a, you know, only a quarter and down significantly from where it was um, just, or where it's going to be in 2023 versus where it is now. Um, and this really frightening picture for us about what the federal government's going to be able to do moving forward um, in the greater economy. The flip side to that, though, is, is that our metropolitan economies, the places where all of us live and work, are increasing to have economic clout and economic power. Um, so even though they only take about 12% 12, 12 of the land area, they have two-thirds of population, three-quarters of GDP, and in almost any single economic indicator, they take a majority, uh, or they produce a majority of national output. And that's incredibly significant for when we think about that federal government pulling back, again, paying more, mostly insurance, national defense, interest. It's our metropolitan economies that are going to be able to boost the American future moving forward. Now, we follow, I hope that can, you can see that better than I can right here, but uh, this is our Metropolitan Monitor. Um, we actually do a version out here for the Mountain West, too. Um, and what it basically shows is that there's totally different uh, levels of performance, though. In other words, we tend to think of a national economy, but if you all of a sudden start to think about metropolitan economies, people are very different performers. So those in the dark blue are, have been doing better than those in the dark orange and kind of the gradation in between um, since the recession hit. And there's some numbers on there that are, you know, you can look through online if you'd like. Um, but this is how Las Vegas looks, right? Um, and this is out of 100 metros. So 
Las Vegas is number 100 in economic recovery. Um, this will be nothing new to those of you who, who talk with the Brookings Mount West folks, and it really is a call to action, right? It's not, it's not to be a put your head down kind of thing. Um, it's really about how can we make sure that the Las Vegas economy is improving moving forward? How can we make sure the industries here are more resilient over when there's future economic hardships that approach it? And how can it make sure that the kind of full industrial landscape um, is really apropos for where the United States will have comparative advantages moving forward? And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit more. We also put out some really interesting research last week on what's going on in inequality in cities too. Um, so increasingly what we're finding in the United States is that there is a huge tranche of winners, right? This is kind of back to the whole, the 1% versus 99% debates. But increasingly really the policy issue du jour of this year is all about income inequality, ladders of opportunity, how can people grow? So these are the most inequality cities um, going from top, and that's not the bottom, but it's stopping at Austin because of the screen size. Um, and you can see, A, Las Vegas is on there, which is a good sign. It's a less unequal um, economy than other places. Um, but this is increasingly something we're confronting too is do we have the kind of opportunity-rich environment that people can prosper? Um, or are we just seeing small tranches at the top gaining most of the success? So that's kind of where we are economically. The question is, you know, what is transportation's role in all that? You know, so far, especially when you typically talk to transportation folks, they just start right away with roads and rails and how they work. Um, and that's not really our approach at the Brookings program. We really care about where, what kind of economy do we want to build and how can we make sure that transportation is in service of it? Um, so, kind of really breaking it down into transportation has three key economic priorities, right? So number one, it helps regions trade goods. So all the stuff, you know, one of the examples I normally give when I'm on the road, it's good we all have clothes on in here, but all the clothes we have on right now, they're not made here, right? They all have to get here from somewhere. The food you eat invariably is not made in your backyard or grown in your backyard, rather. Um, and the products we use at work, computers, uh, screens, phones, in our pockets, right? None of it is made in the place where we are. So transportation allows that to happen. And in the end of the day, metropolitan areas can't grow if they can't trade goods. Um, and one way to think about it in Las Vegas terms where there's much less manufacturing is you can't, what you need to do is trade people and you buy trade people by them coming to you, right? That's the key part of this industry here. And transportation makes that possible. So goods in the exchange of, of things as well as people, if you will, it sounds so cold, but um, is kind of inter-metropolitan transportation. That's what leaves the borders, right, or comes into them. Um, but what it also does um, is it connects people to opportunity, right? We kind of talked about the suburban, uh, suburbanization of, of where people live. Um, what's important is that we have a transportation network that can get them to their jobs. And the final one, which is kind of my favorite one, right, is it lets you enjoy life, right? You want to go shopping, you want to go to the movies, you need to get there, right? No one lives, you know, nothing's just in one kind of single tower, right? And, you know, there's a reason for that because transportation has to connect the old opportunities and no one wants to just live on top of each other. So those are the economic priorities, but what's also happening in the United States is we're seeing huge social changes uh, for how, pe how we kind of live and how that affects transportation. So uh, in terms of education, we are kind of developing a little bit of an education gap in terms of especially STEM skills. Uh, so do people kind of have the ability to get the jobs of the future? Where is that going to affect what kind of transportation they can afford? Um, the elderly population, right? I'm from Florida. They have their own kind of uh, commuting needs that are very different. Well, they're not commuting to work, but you know, kind of traveling to certain spots. Uh, that's very different. Um, of course, immigration. Um, so immigrants tend to have different kinds of transportation um, preferences versus locals. Um, of course, family structure. So as more and more folks um, tend to live on their own, that tends to increase vehicle ownership, let's say, or during the recession, when people start moving home, all of a sudden less vehicles may be on the road. And then uh, migratory patterns. So are people moving between markets or are they staying in one place? All these kind of major social factors which we hear about all the time, they all play into transportation as well. And what's kind of crucial to think about with transportation is we used to build really, really big stuff, right? You know, everything from the canals to the Transcontinental Railroad, the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, really though, the, the major highways, right? That's something in all of our lifetimes in this room, we've kind of seen come to fruition. Um, those are really, really big projects that help make our economy what it is today. Um, but, you know, the kind of, we talked about this a lot, um, actually during the last bridge to, um, last election, the kind of proverbial bridge to nowhere, you know, what are we building now? And how can we make sure that transportation kind of can help ensure we kind of build the economy that we most want moving forward? So if that's the kind of academic -y portion, this is kind of the stat heavy portion, right? So what, how does America move? Um, and in some ways it's probably, you know, what you're used to. So 
we really like to drive. We like to drive a lot. Um, so I can only do this chart back to 1956, but if we can go back to the 1920s and 30s, you would see it's on a constant upward trajectory. Um, in fact, what kind of statisticians have found really interesting here is that economic growth and driving levels had a basically 0.99 correlation, which for stat heads basically means they were the exact same thing. Um, now, of course, economic growth and driving aren't the same thing, but the idea was that as our economy grew, people kept driving more and more miles. Uh, one of the biggest influences that we always talk about is a great thing, women entering the workforce, right? All of a sudden, folks who weren't driving are driving, and there's more cars on the road, and it indicated stronger economic activity. Um, but there's something really, really important that happened, if this can work, right there, right? So all of a sudden, that's about 2004, driving levels stopped going up. And we weren't really sure exactly why, and we've continued to kind of explore it. Um, but one of the major things that's happened is that all of a sudden, Americans are showing a preference for other transportation modes. Um, so everything from transit, biking, and walking have seen dramatic increases relative to what we've seen in the past. Uh, so on the transit side, I mean, this, is, this number is incredible, right? We have 1 million additional commuters every, um, every day, if you will, in terms of what people's preferences are on public transportation systems across the country. Also seen huge increases in light rail ridership in almost every market. And some of them, some of them haven't seen that big. It's other markets like Denver and Salt Lake that are really helping lead the whole country because the systems are designed so well. Um, biking, um, huge increases in bicycle commuting. I want to stress, though, a 61% increase went from about 0.4% of Americans to 0.6%. So it's still quite small, but it's still, you can't find another mode that kind of has seen those kind of increases. But the bottom number is probably the most important, right? Which is all across America, cities are not only redeveloping, they're giving people the opportunity to rent bikes in a kind of communal manner. And it's a huge change, something we've imported from, from Europe and parts of Asia, but it's growing in popularity at rates we really couldn't have expected. And then finally, um, walking or working from home has really increased too. So 4.4% right, of folks work from home. Um, but what's really big is how big of an increase that is from 1990. So this isn't like 0.6% with the bikes. There's a lot of people who are working from home. And this really speaks to the power of broadband penetration across the United States, changing work, um, work office habits, actually led, funny enough, by the federal government, allowing telecommuting and things of that nature. It's really a different commuting environment than what we're used to. So I kind of wanted to show you real quick some research we did on how this plays out in Las Vegas a little bit. So this is the idea of transportation accessibility. And it, it's worth kind of mentioning this real quick. So normally, we used to think about how fast cars could drive. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily tell us where you could actually get to, right? That's how you and I think about transportation every morning or every afternoon or wherever we might be going. Uh, so we did some research on how transit works in, here in Las Vegas and 99 other places across the country. Um, and we found, actually, Las Vegas has the eighth best transit system in the country. Um, now, you all might not be used to hearing that. Some of you might be. Um, I don't know how often you take transit here. Um, but what's crucial is it's not really about the RTA, who, of course, does the best job they can. It's really about land use decisions that were made. And in some ways, land use decisions, decisions that weren't yours to make. Geologically, right, you're hemmed in a little bit. There's nowhere to go in this valley at a certain point. In fact, Bill and I were just going to a meeting today and we kind of talked to me about how uh, we were on the western edge, right? The mountains were just there. There's nowhere else to really go. Um, and that's really helped the ability for people to get to jobs by transit. Um, yet at the same time, what we're confronting, and we'll kind of hopefully talk about this a little bit or maybe in questions, is why aren't people taking transit more than in Las Vegas, right? If the system in some ways is designed to be successful. So that's kind of local transportation. You know, how are we moving if we go between markets? Um, so overall, we've seen train travel is growing dramatically in the United States. 55% right over that 15-year period, um, which is really quite healthy. But what's crucial to this is most people are just taking short distance routes. Um, so the example we always give when we talk about this is, you know, unless you've got a lot of time on your hands, who wants to take a train from Chicago to Seattle, right? It's really long. It's three days. It has delays on it. You can't, you have know, no predictability. Um, but if you talk about trains like this here in um, Market Street Station outside Philadelphia, you know, if you want to go from Philadelphia to New York or DC, you know, the train's perfect. Um, in some parts of the country, including right here in Las Vegas, even if you don't have train service, are actually in an ideal place for it. Of course, your strong connections would be to Phoenix in Los Angeles. What's also changing too, though, is that aviation travel isn't exactly what it used to. 
you know, we used to have a regulated environment, you know, and certain airlines could fly for their regions and only go to certain places and the whole thing was price controlled. Well, everything has changed, right? So we're still the single biggest aviation market in the world. Um, but increasingly, what's kind of helping boost our growth is international passengers, um, something you're certainly familiar with here in Las Vegas. And that kind of change in international connectivity, A, it speaks to the globalization of the world, right? Kind of the Tom Friedman world is flatness, if you will. Um, so if there's more international connectivity, more international business, people are gonna fly international more. Um, but what's also really important to us here is that domestic aviation is no longer growing fast faster than the economy, but international aviation is. And it really kind of speaks to where a lot of our economic opportunities will be moving forward. Um, and that's kind of in some ways what we see here in McCarran, right? Is that 92% growth in international passengers just over the last eight years. Um, just got, saw an article from Bill today that growth is strong already just in 2014 at McCarran. And what's crucial that you don't see here is it's only 6% growth for domestic passengers. So that means more and more of the kind of business is gonna be tapped into from international visitors. Now, the flip side, of course, is that domestic aviation is six times bigger in Las Vegas than international. So all this growth is really just gonna, really a catch up game rather than the international traffic being the biggest element, but still huge, huge numbers. And finally, kind of to where I started with the economic imperatives is how do we trade goods? Um, so we did some recent research trying to understand better how do metropolitan areas trade goods with one another. Um, and one of the key things we found was that it's actually the trade market is so much bigger than we could have ever imagined. Uh, we trade internationally about three point, I believe it's about 3.1 or 3.2 trillion dollars every year. It's a lot of money. Um, but you can see our domestic trade market is significantly bigger. Um, and really this speaks to the amazing transportation and legal network we have here in the US, right? We have highways and, and freight rail that connects all corners of the country. And we have a legal framework that allows interstate commerce to flow. And that really helps all of us kind of, um, well, get access to all those clothes and telephones and everything that we want for our daily life. Um, What's also crucial to show here too is that freight rebounded much faster than some of those first economic indicators I showed, right? So the ability to, to demand goods didn't really, even though it did slow down during the recession, it came back um, with good force all the way into uh, 2010 and 2011 and it's much higher now uh, by the current measures. And then finally, it's important to kind of focus on kind of what, what do certain modes do, right? So I think we, you know, oftentimes if you drive by a big port, let's say you guys go to LA, you see those massive ships, you know, what are they carrying, right? Well, so on the international side, by value, they do carry a huge amount, 46%. Um, but aviation is also a crit critically important. So that's how all of our iPhones get here, right? By all the kind of famous stories we've heard out of the manufacturing facilities in Asia. Um, but on the domestic side, you know, when you feel like you're driving on the highways, always surrounded by those big trucks, they in, are in fact dominating uh, the trade of domestic goods. But here's how it kind of looks in Las Vegas. And Las Vegas has a really unique kind of trading profile. And I want to kind of stay here for one second. So um, number one is that you trade over $55 billion in goods every year, right? That's much, much bigger than um, your economy overall. Um, and then the metropolitan rank though is, is pretty small. And the reason for that is, is that you all don't make very much, right? <laughs> you make really good experiences for people, um, but you don't actually make physical stuff. So most of it is actually on the importing side. Um, and you can also see that you're not as globally uh, connected, if you will, as other most uh, markets in the United States. Um, it's pretty significantly smaller, right? About 50 per, or two, one third smaller, excuse me. Um, but who you trade with is also really interesting to us. So in many markets, um, China is the number one single trading partner, right? Now, of course, that's kind of an unfair comparison, right, of a single market in the US to one whole big, really big country. Um, but here in, in Las Vegas, that's not true. Um, and even more importantly, why I kind of highlighted Phoenix in red there, is that you have a market that you're not even that well connected to that you're trading a significant amount of goods with. Um, and this is really kind of a major argument in many ways for all the conversation about I-11 to the south. Um, if you think about Los Angeles or San Diego or Salt Lake City, right, and then of course, points even further, right, east certainly, um, you have direct interstate connections. To Phoenix though, your number two trading partner, no, no direct interstate connection. Okay, so eyes are still open, that's a stat part of the program, right? Um, so hopefully this will kind of bring home what this is all about, right? Um, so, you know, policy fails in quite a few ways, and this is a huge debate we're gonna be talking about this summer. Um, in, in Washington DC, and it will be filtering to, to every community across the country, which is, we are flat broke. Now, there's a side, you have the, you know, um, 
uh, Mrs. Yellen could, uh, could print some more money than you fed share. Um, but this isn't really about printing money. Um, remember that line I showed you where VMT, the driving levels, all of a sudden were tabling? Well, unfortunately, the problem is we didn't stop spending, but we kind of stopped bringing in money. Because as we drive less, we spend less in gas taxes. So what you're seeing happen here is where we go to broke. And that's not very far from now. In fact, it's, it's basically just at the end of the summer. And when we go broke, um, states are going to have big problems. They're not going to be able to build the, the roads they want. Um, they're not going to be able to send money down. It may not happen as much in Nevada, as I've learned here, but in many states across the country, the, they won't be able to give as much money to their big metropolitan areas to help build sidewalks or bike trails and things of that nature. Um, and it's a huge problem for us to consider that we need to find a way to make up kind of the, the difference, right? How do we get back up here? Um, and the only way we can do it is through more revenue. Um, but unfortunately, except you know, the president said he wanted some more today, but he didn't say exactly how he was going to do it. Some pretty standard Washington acrobatics, if you will, with words. Um, but at the end of the day, we're going to have to talk about either gas taxes or other ways to get revenue in, into the program. Otherwise, you're going to see big, big problems for road construction in the United States. Now, at the same time, we have a huge problem at the federal level because we let people build any of the stuff on the left they want. But if you want to build a new transit line, right, or a new transit station, it's incredibly competitive. So what we basically have decided in the United States is if you want to build a highway, you want to build an interchange, you can do it whatever way you want, within reason, right, of environmental regulations and, and such. But if you want to build a transit line, you have to actually get in the line. You have to get in the queue behind everyone else in front of you who wanted to apply for it. And you need to prove how many people you connect to jobs, right, like the map I showed for Las Vegas, or what you're going to do for property values. And it's a big, big difference. And it's one of the major reasons we've seen so many highways all over the US landscape, even the ones that weren't in the original plan, um, and some of which that you know, we hoped would have been, but, but didn't end up getting built. Um, so this is a major reason. Next time, again, I said I'm from Florida, right? It's the kind of classic Joni Mitchell. They paved paradise. Um, next time you're driving around, you see strip center after strip center or big highways. In some ways, you can blame the federal government for it, because we said this is what we wanted to build. Now, on the Amtrak side, right, I talked about we're, we're, we're taking more uh, train trips. And that's a really good thing. And, and many of those short distance routes are actually making money, which is one of the unique things that happens in transportation. The problem, though, is, is that all those long haul routes, right, I talked about going to Chicago, uh, from Chicago to Seattle, um, they're not carrying many people. And in fact, they're losing a tremendous amount of money. Um, the routes that are on the screen, these are just the ones that are losing at least $40 million per year. Um, and we have big problems with that, if for nothing else, because you know, look, it's really nice to have train travel across the country, but we're not really sure if we should be subsidizing it to over half a billion dollars per year. Um, there's many other things we could spend money on. Um, and you know, if the tickets aren't affordable or we need to figure out other ways to pay for it, we can do that. Um, but the key thing is, when you talk about, let's say, your neighbors in California having trouble building their high-speed rail system, part of that is because Amtrak loses so much money from routes that are nothing like what California high-speed rail will be. And it kind of gives a bad name to the public. Another problem we have is that we have no national freight strategy in the United States. So all those goods we move, right? So for every dollar in output, we trade $1.50 worth of goods. Um, again, that's back to that $20 trillion in goods that are traded every year. Well, these three countries and many others, they have a national freight strategy. They decide where and, and how they're going to invest in freight assets, right? Which ports are most important? Which highways are most important? In the United States, we have absolutely nothing. It's a program without direction. Um, and this is another big debate, if it's that's your kind of cup of tea, that they're going to be talking about in Washington this summer, too. So those are kind of some federal problems. Let's talk about what's going on in the states. Um, this is VMT again. It'll, the label will come up in one second. That's, again, vehicle miles traveled. Um, and this is the actual line. And you'll see kind of in 2004, an inflection point was hit. This is what states collectively to the US government predicted was going to happen with VMT. Every single year it moved forward, they kept thinking the increase that we saw in the past was going to happen again and again and again. And this is a consequence of why we've ended up keep building more. It's why everyone's asking for more transportation money. And it's really a classic case, right, of not learning from your own lessons. Um, and for us, this is one of the biggest issues um, with what state VMTs, uh, state programs have done. And I kind of talked about mobility over accessibility. And, and this is part of the source of the problem is in many ways we teach engineers in this country that you know, to be a hammer, and every problem is a nail, right? 
And the problem is, or the solution is always either more lane miles or a brand new highway or four lanes need to go to six lanes. It's always the same solution because what they care about I'm really liking this pointer now. Normally I don't use one. Uh, <laughs> what they care about is speed, right? They want things to be fast. But what you and I care about is where can I get to, right? The accessibility. How do things connect to one another? And that's what we need to start thinking about in this country, right? Is how can we make sure people get to where they want to go? It's not necessarily how fast they do it, but they need to think about how quickly can they do it by their own time, right? So if something's closer and you walk, you know, that might be better than taking a longer trip on a you know, four-lane uh, four road in the suburbs. Again, so much of this lies on the states. Um, but the locals you know, are not kind of free of blame here, too. So I'm sorry, these colors are kind of, kind of close. But what's on the left is Vermont, and on the right is the country of Slovenia. Um, the 100 biggest cities in the United States, and they're extended kind of suburbs, too, um, they consume that much land in the last 10 years, from 2000 to 2010. So think about that. All the forests in Vermont all the forests in Slovenia. Slovenia is a country we played in the last World Cup, too. It's a real place. Um, th it's all gone, right? It's all paved now. It's all houses. Look, it's great. People have places to live. But we're not really sure if that's sustainable, because we, we can build more houses, but we can't build more Vermonts, right? We only have so much of that. That's why being a landowner is such a smart play. Um, and in many ways, that's on our local governments for right, not hemming in development, not being smart about where we're going. It also kind of affects how public transportation is able to serve our communities, too. So as everything keeps getting further out, what we've decided, um, including here in Las Vegas, is we want to send routes to every corner. We want to give someone an opportunity to get on a bus or a train or commuter rail line. But the flip side to it is, and this is what Las Vegas does well, but most actually places don't, is that they really have trouble getting to jobs. So Las Vegas ranked, I, I said they ranked number eight in the country. Um, if you're taking transit, the average person, um, you can get to 40% of jobs in 90 minutes. And that puts you number eight in the whole country. Think about if you can only get to four out of 10 jobs, right, if you didn't have a car available. But as you can see in many markets, it's even worse. And there's what we've been calling a transit paradox, right? So low income people have the, most, the easiest ability to get on transit, about 89% of those households. Um, but the jobs they might be most qualified for, low skill ones, are actually the least connected, right? And part of the reason for that is, again, I've talked about how we've consumed more land, keep moving further out. What's happened is jobs are moving further out now, too. So you kind of have that classic argument, right, of you know, the city got bottomed out, everyone moved to the suburbs. Well, well, the jobs have followed them now, right? So it's a huge amount that are at least 10 miles from the central business district. That doesn't even include all the jobs that are between 10 and 3 miles from the central business district. And as I talked about at the beginning, we're seeing more and more people have to, what they call drive to qualify. So they have to move out to the suburbs to be able to find a house that they can afford. And all of a sudden, they're putting themselves in a tough position to be able to get to all those jobs. It puts transit in a bad spot, forces people to drive long miles, put on not only more miles on their car, then becomes more expensive in terms of the cost for automobile ownership. And it really puts families at a disadvantage in the United States. But, the private sector is not kind of um, out of the woods on this one either. This all doesn't just fall on government. In some ways, we kind of have some market failures we're seeing too. So um, that's, that's right, $1.6 trillion every year is spent on transportation. That's kind of our total economy that goes into transportation activities. And the public spending is only $170 million of it. Um, so next time you kind of hear government does everything with transportation, it's absolutely not true. In fact, the federal government is only about a one third of, of uh, public spending of transportation. And that's had some very real consequences for what we see in the environment in particular. Um, so just over these last 20 years, uh, freight trucks, right, which are run by the private sector, rail, which is run by the private sector, um, have all emitted seriously more carbon into the environment, right? So as we keep kind of seeing public, the, the private sector use infrastructure more and more, we don't really have kind of some clear kind of climate controls on how we do it. We're also seeing more congestion on the roads. That's kind of what's being symbolized on the top there. Passenger cars aren't remiss from all this, right? 20% increase is pretty serious for how many Americans drive. Again, 3 trillion miles a year. So it's a lot of carbon being spewed out by those cars. The private sector is at play here, and it's why it's crucial that they work alongside the public sector on things like carbon emissions, right? The miles per gallon you see on your car, kind of fuel efficiency. It's really important. But also how we kind of ship goods across places, right? Rail's a lot more carbon efficient than trucks are, right? How can we make sure we move more goods uh, by truck versus, uh, or by rail versus truck? So those are some of the problem areas in transportation, but you know, kind of, let's end on a high note, right? What are, what are some of the solutions that we can talk about? Um, 
So in many ways, kind of this is a good kind of image encapsulation of everything I've kind of been pushing out, right? This is our old business model, right? Dirty energy, sprawling development, a lot of cars, more sprawl, right? Very consumption driven, um, very much thinking about how can everyone kind of get their piece, right? Not a very kind of sharing society, if you will. Um, but we're seeing changes afoot, right? Even right here in Las Vegas. So we want cleaner energy. We want transportation choices. We might change kind of how and where you can drive into central business districts, right? Different kinds of fuel efficient cars, if not fully electricity uh, based automobiles. Um, and even kind of smart technology in our homes, right? So if people are working from home more, how can they make sure they emit less carbon in that way? In many ways, this is about defining what kind of economy do we want to be. And federal policy has a key role to play here. So we need to make sure we push new laws that are kind of more in sync with what economy uh, we want to grow. And I'm not going to go into all the details of this stuff. It gets a little too wonky. But this is crucial, right? Second is we need to kind of recognize how important the private sector is when it comes to transportation. Um, so we need to make sure, right, we have opportunities that when the private sector wants to partner on infrastructure construction, that we have an office, right, that can help state DOTs or the federal ag uh, agencies be able to negotiate freely with them. Imagine if, imagine if you were across the table from someone, J.P. Morgan Chase, right, and you were trying to figure out how to negotiate a deal. It's kind of what a lot of our state kind of DOT, um, state transportation folks are dealing with right now. So an office can really be helpful to make sure they can broker better deals for the public. And then finally, as I talked about, we need to have a national freight strategy. We can't talk about transportation and economic development in isolation. But we also need to make sure that we kind of replicate lessons at the local level that work too. You know, the federal government can't have all the answers. Um, so one of the programs that we like the most, um, right here in your neck of the woods, if you will, broadly speaking, is out of Los Angeles. Um, they passed a ballot referendum, right, half a cent sales tax increase, um, which for them means they get $40 billion under their personal control for 30 years. They don't need to ask anyone for permission as long as it's under you know, federal right and state regulations on how to spend it. And they're able to kind of start construction, like you see on the screen there, uh, of a light rail line that's going to dramatically change how the classic kind of archetypal autotropolis, right, because you know, Detroit made it and Los Angeles used it, right? They're going to change how they develop. One of the interesting things we talk about on the road, too, it's so kind of fascinating how Los Angeles is doing this. Los Angeles is the densest metropolitan area in the country. You wouldn't think it because they drive everywhere, but it's a sea of two and three story apartments everywhere. They're trying to create even more density. They want to make sure they have a resiliency, if you will, not in the environmental sense, but kind of a long term economic health. Make sure they have a competitive position, like for some of the young talent in the room right now. They want you to come to Los Angeles and live there. And Measure R is a big part of that. This is actually my neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Um, and they used also a really interesting technique when it came to transit and building other infrastructure. They worked alongside the private sector to help fund a whole new transit stop on a rail line that was already there. Um, so they call it, again, they call it value capture. There's different ways it can be done. But the idea is kind of crucial. And it's, it's something where only the United States does it this way, especially of developed markets, is we've decided that if you're going to build public transportation, the public has to do it all on their own. And all of the profits from it go to the private sector. Whoever's fortunate enough to be a landowner right around there, if they're going to build a new rail line, let's say, um, they get all the money. And no other country in the world does it that way. Because in the end of the day, if we want more infrastructure, especially kind of the kind of infrastructure like rail transit or bus rapid transit that helps create more density, we're going to need the private sector to help out too. It can't all be on the public to do it, especially if some people are going to be lucky enough to profit in huge amounts. Um, so this kind of program is now starting to be mimicked and looked at across the country because, again, right, the federal government doesn't have as much money to come help. So the, the local areas are going to need to figure out how they can do more on their own. And that's exactly what Washington, D.C. did in this instance. Another really cool program that we like that's kind of a combination of, of the feds but working with locals is this idea of an affordability uh, portal. So what they can do is if you put an address, let's say you want to move somewhere else in Las Vegas, right, it will tell you what the expected housing costs are there. You know, that's something a real estate agent could tell you or someone you call up for an apartment building, right? But it'll also tell you what your expected transportation costs are too. So the number two uh, expense for every household in America is transportation. Um, it's more than food, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, this kind of um, really software in the end of the day, right? You can, anyone can run it off a website. Um, will allow us to make better decisions to understand really what 
how does location affect our pocketbooks, right? Not just the metropolitan economy, your personal kind of day-to-day -day expenses or certainly monthly expenses. Um, and this is really an incredible program that was done with some of our partners uh, or our colleagues at the Center for, um, um, uh, Center for Transorient Development and some other folks doing really years and years of research. And it's actually a really cool tool and I, I recommend you guys check it out if you have time. So kind of, that's, those are some kind of federal and, and local examples. What would we argue, what can Las Vegas do when it comes to transportation? I, I promise this is the end. Um, so A, you gotta think about what kind of industries do you wanna grow, right? Transportation is a means to an end. It can help you get where you wanna go, but what kind of industries do you wanna build? Do you want more manufacturing? Do you want more life sciences? Do you wanna be a logistics center? How can you make sure you develop with purpose? Um, you know, I've been talking to quite a few folks who've been lucky enough to have a lot of meetings here. I've never seen an economy on paper that is less diversified than Las Vegas, right? Everything is in leisure. Even the manufacturing is in leisure related activities, right? For slot machines and other kind of great technology. And it's really worked for you all. And it probably will continue to work moving forward. Um, there's no question you are the adult leisure capital of the world, basically. Um, but you can do more and you can attract more people. And there's definitely some actors in town who are trying to do that. Um, but being purposeful about it can really then make sure you build infrastructure to relate to what kind of industries you're trying to grow. So as part of that is you gotta start to recognize that the federal government is not going to come to save you. It's a really big model. It's something that, you know, in fact, we've been talking to folks about it even this week, right? Making trips to Washington, asking folks for help. Um, how can we get money here um, in Las Vegas? And look, if that works, that's great. But in some ways, it's kind of like moving out of your house with your parents, right? It's time to kind of take a little bit more responsibility for the transportation you want to build. And how can you use all the amazing local assets that are here, right? These amazing global companies that headquarter right here in Las Vegas, plus others, right? To find the, the kind of consensus more than anything on what industries you want to grow and what transportation you can build. And thinking about it like this, right? You're in competition with other markets across the country and they're already taking the lead, right? just like Los Angeles is, $40 billion of their own money, because they want to attract all the young talent you want to attract. And they're making a purpose-built effort to do that. So what is Las Vegas going to do? I mean, I don't necessarily have the answers um, to make sure that the, you can get all that talent, that you can grow the industries you're looking to grow. And then finally, thinking about transportation as a mode to create long-term economic health. It's not about how fast you can drive on a certain road, although that's important, especially if you live further out. But how can you make sure that you use transportation to build a different kind of community, right? So one of the things I've heard written about quite a bit here, right, is this idea of building light rail lines in, in Las Vegas. That would probably do wonders for your economy, probably help attract some of that talent. But how are you going to make sure that those deals come together? You know, if feds aren't going to come and save the day for you, if they're not going to help kind of build most of that system, how can people come together and design a light rail system or a bus rapid transit system or even potentially more roads, let's say like I-11 down to your trading partner in Phoenix, that help this economy grow. If you think about infrastructure that way, you're gonna to tend to get better results and different kind of features than we've seen over the past few decades in the United States. That's all I got. So thanks for coming. Um, I hope we're gonna take some questions. I think Bill might lead it, but again, thanks for staying through everything. I would be shocked if this group didn't have a few questions after that. Uh, let me get out of the light here so I can see, sir. A book very recently came out, and the concept was originated by John Casarda, who is an urban policy planner and whatnot. <clears throat> and that's the concept of an aerotropolis, where the airport is the hub of the activity for the city, and everything is built out from it. Uh, Memphis and Detroit are working on this idea of rebuilding the cities through becoming an aerotropolis. Wouldn't McCarran? with its situation, the fact that airlines and the airport directly and indirectly pump $30 billion into Southern Nevada's economy. Couldn't that be a possible alternative source? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I'm familiar with uh, John Casarda's work. I don't know him, so I'm not gonna call him John or anything like that. Uh, but um, you know, we are not fans of the Aerotropolis concept. Let me start there. So um, the most important thing an airport does for a local economy is when people leave it. And it, you right, so if someone just transfers, you know, if they just jump on another plane, which primarily they don't do in Las Vegas. Las Vegas isn't a good spot. I mean, I'll get to it in a second. But if they don't leave the airport, then all it does is create some, sure, some airport-related jobs. But people don't leave to spend their money on something else or have a business meeting elsewhere or, you know, go home to their family. They don't spend money in the, in the economy. Um, and so much of what Casarda is kind of pitching is really about 
keeping economic activity as close to that airport as possible. And we're not really sure if that taps into it. A, I'm not sure if you want to live near an airport. <laughs> now, I don't know businesses that really want to do it. And I think more importantly is how can you make sure your, you know, transportation is a means to an end. So how can you make sure your airport best uh, puts your industries in the best position to prosper? And then hopefully at the same time, you know, your households can connect for easier, easier leisure travel to Asia or Europe, right? You know, that's, that's honestly less of a concern. McCarran already does an unbelievable job at that, right? By all of our measures, most of the places that are uh, successful airports are also hubs, right? You, I, I, don't, I can't remember if Southwest Anomaly calls you a hub. The point is, it doesn't matter, right? You're like New York. Flights are gonna come here because people want to come to Las Vegas, right? And that's the most important thing you have overall. Now, where this kind of defers, though, is when it comes to the cargo side. You know, we were just talking with folks this morning about it. Um, many places, when they want to become an aerotropolis, they want to be able to use industry to make more stuff to sell it. But what they lose in the process is they develop their airport, but they forget public sector can't develop industry, right? You can do research. You know, it can be funded at a high level, and it can happen organically over time. Um, you know, we all get to benefit from the internet, right, let's say. Um, but in the end of the day, a, a local economy can't control that. And what you have to do is kind of create the best environment possible for those industries to grow on their own. And if you grow industries that actually make stuff, then you can see increasing cargo activity at your airport. That starts here, right? You're going to continue to have food service and things come that way. Um, but I, I would suggest McCarran is, I mean, most places would kill to be in the position McCarran's in, right? So it's an incredible asset for this, for this region. Sure. Uh, yes, I, you know, it's interesting you mentioned about the uh, transportation of, of, of goods on, on and, uh, you know, I've, I've been for a long time looking for ways to sort of try to force more of the goods, particularly long haul, off of trucks and off of highways onto, and it would have to be updated rails, but because there's so much, again, so much highway building, that everything is pretty much gone by trucks, a lot of it has, and ways to force that over. So, and I don't know if how much ways to do that, but you know, as far as, also as far as funding, a lot of things, but certainly transportation too, moving away from the gas or even the sales tax to cash flow and revenue, and that's really my fundamental question. What do you think of the idea of more like cash flow based, revenue based taxes for funding this rather than, because if we get more efficient on the use of gas, then our gas taxes fall. Yeah, there's. They are, revenue would still increase. But anyway. Yeah, sure. No, um, there's some really good ideas out there that, one in particular that we really support, which, you know, the gas tax should really become a carbon tax for the US, right? You know, burning gas is not good for the environment. Um, you know, whether it's gas that's, you know, made, if you will, right, right here in the US or imported from other countries. Um, and really what we should, probably should switch to is making that, the gas tax a carbon tax that can be a flat fee per gallon, kind of like it is now. Hopefully it'll change over time. Um, and we should really start charging people for how often and when they drive, right? A VMT fee, which I believe actually Nevada is potentially going to look at. Um, and that's kind of more of a cash flow program. And, and really, we have the technology for it. It would be a transponder in your car. It's kind of like Easy Pass out east, right? And everywhere you go, they'd kind of track you. And the ACLU would make sure that you know it's not used against you in, in court or something, right? Or a divorce case. I'm being serious, too. That's, that's really something that they've already worked out. It's, it's incredible. Um, and then, you know, when you drive during the busiest part of the day and you cause the most congestion and cars slow down, right, and, and actually spew more carbon out, you would, you would be charged a little bit more for that. Um, you know, if you drive on a highway where there's no one on it in the middle of the night, you wouldn't be charged very much at all for your, for your travel. So those ideas are out there. The technology's there. And actually, states like Nevada who are, want to investigate it, your colleagues in Oregon are already doing it. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not the wave of the future like we think it's going to happen. It, it will happen. It's just a question of when. Um, and then it's a question of what we're going to do with the gas tax in response. Thought there was another question. Was it? Please. Oh, I think this is the ideal time to be investing in new infrastructure, but I don't want the new infrastructure to look like the old infrastructure. We should be investing in um, low greenhouse gas infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think that's the key. The key argument here is, you know. It's going to be on metropolitan areas on their own to decide what they want to do. You know, um, you know, Las Vegas is going to have to decide what kind of infrastructure it wants to build and you know how it can kind of complement you know things that might be long distance versus things that are more local serving. And 
you know, make the environment cleaner, you know, um, it's, it's instead of seeing it as a, as a bad change, it's an amazing change, right? So it's, it's a time of opportunity for metropolitan areas to, to make the, really make the kind of um, built environment that they want, you know, for both their residents and their industry. So, so I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. Right. <laughs> Interest rates are low too. Bye now. <laughs> Does anyone like a last question? Oh, please. I have a question. Uh, high speed uh, passenger rail service from in the Northeast Corridor. The question is, why don't we have it? Yeah, right. Well, so you have, there was a proposal that got really close, the Desert Express, right? Um, where they were looking for $6 billion in a loan from the federal government that they kind of basically balked at. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, our position is that the best thing, you know, um, pilot projects, if you will, right, tend to work best. So if, if the West can get California high-speed rail, which we are huge proponents of, irrespective of some of the kind of legal kind of wrangling that's going on in that state right now, um, the second busiest air corridor in the whole country is between Los Angeles and San, Diego, uh, San Francisco. And that doesn't begin to add in all those other towns that fly between each other. People are going to take that train and you know, hopefully folks from Nevada get to enjoy the Pacific Coast, right? And they go there and they'll take the train um, and they're gonna see how incredible it is, right? Folks who are fortunate enough to not just travel to Europe, but especially travel to Japan, you know, they come home with these stories saying, this, these trains are incredible, right? Why don't we have that here? And I think you're right, the Northeast Corridor has it, but we have so many problems because the Northeast is so overdeveloped already. Everything's so tight, they, it's hard to find space and the price tag for that makes California look like nothing. So if we can build that California system, right, where so many tourists, not just from here, all over the country, the world, um, go to Los Angeles and San Francisco in particular, um, and they can see it and bring those ideas home, we think that's gonna be the, one of the best ways to champion it. Look, nothing's cheap in infrastructure, and certainly nothing's free. Um, so figuring out how to kind of get the public behind it, right, is the only way you can get the will to kind of find, uh, you know, the courage almost to, to come up with some of those big price, uh, price tags that these uh, projects have. And just have a follow up to that. Do you think airline lobbyists are fighting that? Yes. Because I think, you know, <laughs> one of the biggest roads is Vegas to LA. Airlines, I think there are over 30 or 40 daily flights, something like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Southwest, actually, not, not, I have no idea what they're doing here, but there's an urban legend that seems to be verified that in Texas, where Texas makes a lot of sense too, they call it like Texas T bone, I think, but it's like on its head. Um, you know, those, they have four huge markets there um, that are perfect distance for rail, not much in between because um, it's you know, just the way kind of Texas has been set up. And so the trains will go so fast, they, there's no arguments over certain towns being cut out, right? Which is the stuff kind of California is dealing with a little bit. Um, and they can't, they can't get any support for it. And Texas loves buying stuff and they're really rich too. So um, supposedly Southwest Airlines lobbied pretty heavily against it. But you know, one of the things we counter with is if you ever go um, to France, that actually, you know, Air France is a somewhat partner in the rail system there, right? They saw it as an amazing opportunity to feed the TGV, their high-speed rail, to Charles de Gaulle Airport. To say, look, if you're gonna travel in the country, great, this system works perfectly for you. Um, but if you wanna go further, you know, give your business to us, right, like a commercial. So, um, you know, I, we think eventually the airlines will probably come around to that because like I showed on the chart, right, their growth market is, is not just international, it's longer distance travel, right? And, and the train has something incredible to offer there. Oh, in the back, please. Um, so you talked about how the federal government is no longer going to be giving uh, municipalities more money. Well, it brings up an interesting point of where does this money come from? And a lot of metropolitan areas are very fragmented, uh, especially east where you have, you know, like I'm from Pittsburgh, and there's hundreds of cities. Um, and so coordination of actually getting those funds seems to be a very, very big problem. You know, fortunately out here, our counties are huge. All of Clark County uh, is, Las Vegas is encompassed in Clark County. Same thing in LA. I don't know where the funds we were saying LA was able to generate that money. I don't know if that was from the county. But so we're, we're, how do we coordinate these, the new revenue streams to get the money to make these infrastructure projects? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, and yes, just as a, the brief of it, LA, that's an LA County measure, does not include Orange County. So Orange County is kind of on their own on this. Um, not surprising they wouldn't make those kind of investments. They're kind of different designed community. Uh, broadly speaking. Um, you know, look, a lot of this requires a really good, strong regional government, right? It can be at the county level, but increasingly it needs to be across counties, right? So, and you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Out east, it's really complicated because jurisdictions geographically tend to be smaller. And it's one of the reasons that even out east, we point to what's going on out west 
to say what the country can be, right? Your colleagues, if you will, in Denver and Salt Lake are really leading the country in terms of successful redevelopments through fixed rail transit investments, right, to change their economic trajectory moving forward. Um, and you know, part of that is because they have incredible metropolitan governments. Um, in Minneapolis, where many consider it to be the best metropolitan planning organization in the country, so that's a re quasi regional government which handles transportation. Um, you know, they're building out new light rail investments, bus rapid transit as well, sidewalk improvements, incredible work going on in Minneapolis. They have one of the highest biking rates actually in the country, and it's freezing, you know, three to four months of the year. Um, and, you know, it's really incredible stuff, and it's exactly your point is they've found a way to come together on these issues, right? Especially with the public sector, but also behind the scenes with the private sector. And that can't be undersold. And that's where no matter what anyone kind of drops, you know, all the numbers I can drop on the screen, right? And at the end of the day, it's about relationships, right? And people trusting each other and deciding how they want to grow as a community. And it sounds kind of like flaky language, but in the end of the day, those are how deals are made. Um, and that's what's gonna be crucial for markets like Las Vegas is figuring out how to get that kind of regional, um, in whatever your structures are, right, that regional kind of consensus behind wherever you wanna go. One thought I had while you were talking, in terms of Salt Lake City, we were there not, not too long ago and taking a tour of their new light rail system that gets you right out to the airport. And the mayor made the point of saying, you have McCarran Airport, even though we just built this entire light rail system, we'd trade it for McCarran Airport in a minute and build light rail again. <laughs> so to get back to the airport question, it's an incredible asset, right? 40 plus million visitors a year and, and other things. We have to figure out together how to maximize our assets going forward. Was there another question or did I? Have Great. We'll be around if you have a question. You didn't want to ask, and uh, thanks for coming. We'll be here again next week. We'll uh, switch to foreign policy and have colleague Bruce Jones out. Uh, we thought with, a po with the post-Olympic euphoria behind <laughs> us, we should take a, a real look, at, a, a new look, and an updated look at what's going on globally and how the United States is or isn't prepared to respond to it. Thanks again for coming. Hope we see you next week.